Amen. God is good. And all the time. Oh, right on. It's so good to see everybody today. Have you have a good week? Yes? Are you loved? Yes. You loving people? Yes. Praise the Lord. Of course. Of course. You think. It's like a fellowship, man. Right on. Well, hey, let's just take a moment and pray. And then we're going to dig into uh, 1 John. All right? So, Father, we just come before you again in the name of Jesus. It's so good to be here in the house of the Lord. It's so good just to know that, that you've been here, you've been preparing our heart for today. You've prepared this place for us. You've prepared your word. And so this morning we just come with, with clean hands and a hungry heart, wanting just to be fed the pure word, the pure milk of the word, the meat of the word. We love you, Lord. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we just finished up 2 Peter, and so we're going to go right on into 1 John. I love John. John is like, he's my guy. I mean, of, of all the Gospels, it's John. I mean, you, you look at, you, as you look at Matthew, you see Matthew looking at Christ as the king. He is the rightful king of David. I mean, he fits the genealogy. He's the king. As you look at Mark, Mark depicts uh, Jesus as the servant. And as we look at Dr. Luke's gospel, Luke depicts, well, the humanity size of Jesus. It would be in the gospel of Luke that he used that phrase, uh, son of man, over and over and over again. But John, John declares him as God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Jesus saying things like, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the bread of life. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I mean, Jesus, John depicts Christ as God, right? And I just, I love that. I love the book of Revelation. What an exciting book. Did you know that it's the only book that has its own blessing? <laughs> Blessed are those who read it, those who hear it, and those who obey the words thereof. Man, just, just let it sink in. It's part of my daily read uh, this month as I'm going through the Bible in a year we're going through Revelation again, so it's, it's just great. I love it. I love it. Now as we dig into 1 John, one of three specific epistles, it's the Apostle John who wrote it. He's known as John the Revelator because he wrote John, he wrote Revelation, excuse me. He's known as John the Elder or the Presbyter. He's also known as one of the Sons of Thunder. How would you like to be known as, as one of the one of the sons of a, of, of a bad attitude. That was, sometimes that is me. Sometimes I find I am a son of thunder. Oh. But you know what? Praise God for transformation. We see John as the apostle of what? Of love. Isn't that great? I mean, the Lord takes us from glory to glory to greater glory. John is the apostle of love. He's going to just share with us in this book, Love, love, love. Did you know in this little letter alone, he uses the word 36 times? Great. I mean, we're really going to be digging into love. The early church fathers uh, attribute these letters to him. As we look at um, Irenaeus and Clement, as we look at Tertullian and Origen, all of those say, hey, John wrote these, these excuse me, epistles. Um, but the two most notable ones that declare that John was the author would be um, Polycarp and Papias. Now, um, Polycarp was actually John's disciple. Both of these two men um, were alive during John's day. They knew John. We talk about eyewitness accounts. How would you like to be a, a, a disciple of, of John? How, how awesome would that be? You know, or, or of Paul, yeah. or of Jesus. If that's who you are today. You're a disciple of Jesus Christ. More than just a believer, but a disciple, a student, a learner. 
that you too are being changed from glory to glory. Now, although John never signed his name in any of his epistles, he didn't even do it in, in uh, his gospel. That's kind of John's M.O. He's always kind of the man behind the scene. He's the one who's always taking the picture and you never see the photographer. You know, that's John. He's always taking the picture of everything. This is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And you never really see much about John, but as you re read these epistles, you can hear the flavor. You can hear John in the background. In Revelation, he says, this is I, John, who writes these. But he does it in these other ones, and we'll notice that. He uses terms like the one who Jesus loved or the other disciple. You know, because it was the other disciple that beat Peter to the tomb. Not mentioning any names, by the way. John. John wrote this for a specific reason. He wrote it in about A.D. 85 through 89. It was after his gospel, but, but before uh, the book of Revelation. And he wrote this because of this teaching of Gnosticism was really ramping up in the church. Um, Gnosticism, it comes from the word gnosko, which means to know. And, and these guys were teaching that Jesus, well, they taught that the flesh was evil and that the spirit was pure. And, and so, because the, the flesh was evil, the Son of God couldn't really have come in the flesh. And so, if you look closely at the footprints of Jesus, that there weren't any. And they were, they were teaching these weird apparition things, yeah. Never cast a shadow. And, and, and so, John, although he used the word love 36 times, he wanted his disciples to know who Jesus was. And he uses the word know 39 times. Almost 40 times John says, for we know, for we know. We know we love the brethren. We know we are children of God. We know. 39 times to come up against this, this Gnostic teaching. And they would teach that they have got the secret knowledge. And if you want to come, you need to come to listen to them. And that was kind of like the, the Nicolaitans of uh, Revelation chapter 2 and 3. The Nicolaitans who would rule over people. These Gnostics were these high learned men. Uh, isn't it incredible all these, these Jesus seminars that they had a couple of, of decades ago? And as they were looking at all of the words of Jesus, you know, they're looking at the red letters. They finally came up with what Jesus probably said because he didn't say that. He didn't say this. And well, he couldn't have said that. They came up with only one phrase out of the whole gospel account that Jesus actually would say. And it's better to, to give than to receive. Now, we believe that Jesus said that. But they cannot testify to anything else. Isn't that crazy? And these are the higher learned guys. Very, very gnosko if you would. So John starts off defending the gospel, declaring the character of God. Next week we'll be looking at the character of God, and he goes on to talk about the character of the true Christians. I mean, if, if God is light, we should be children of light. If God is love, should we not be loved? Isn't that the new commandment Christ gave us? Mm -hmm. And if God is life, we need to be sons and daughters of life. Amen? Amen. Today, John just kind of gives us his testimony. He reflects a little bit. And so we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 4. And I bet I can squeeze an hour in four verses. So we're going to start and just look at the first four verses. Read with me in 1 John chapter 1. And we'll just look at the verses uh, 1 and 2. And it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested. We have seen and bear witness or testify and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. I mean, just reading that, I can, all, I can hear, you know, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and the, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John is, is saying from the very beginning, 
Christ was. He declared that in his gospel. And, and I'm not only an eyewitness account, but I heard it. John heard the word, behold, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. John touched him. John would be the disciple who leaned into the Lord and said, no, really, who's going to betray you? It's Peter, isn't it? No? Who is it, Lord? And the Lord would say, it's the one who I give this bread to as you dip the bread and hand it over to who? To Judas. John said, I touched him. I saw him. I heard God live with us. I mean, just, just imagine that. God living with us. Isn't that exciting? Man, I have my, my sister and her family staying for a few days at our place. And you know, it's always fun having relatives over. It's fun. Imagine the Lord coming and visiting your house. Zacchaeus, we're going to your house for lunch. Yeah, that's great. In the beginning. Even Micah declared that Jesus was, was in the beginning. In, in, in Micah chapter 5, you might remember this prophecy on where he would be born. Remember when, when the wise men came into Jerusalem and, and Herod was saying, well, where is this Messiah to be born? And what did they say? Where? You can say it out loud again. Where was the Messiah to be born? In Bethlehem. It came out of Micah 5 too. And Micah says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting, or from days of eternity. Isn't that amazing? He always was. We read in the beginning God, but really, does he have a beginning? Well, the creation does, but does God? Was, he is, and he, he always what he is to come. He's coming back. So Micah declared it. And of course, I, we just kind of talked about it in Genesis. In the beginning, God. I love that. And John's declaring it here. That which was from the beginning. The very beginning. We saw it. We heard it. We touched it. That eternal life which was with God, it was manifested to us, God in the flesh. Hebrews 1.3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Exactly. Jesus would say, if you've seen me, you've seen Dad. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The exact image John is telling us that Jesus was and he is and he is to come he was at the beginning of creation and he walked with these guys I mean, John is writing this letter at a, a young age of I don't know 90 I mean, and he's thinking back yeah, I walked with him. I walked with him. I knew him. It reminds me of a little boy in Sunday school. The teacher was asking them, why do we know all the different names of God? And boy, little Johnny shot his head. It was, his name's Andy. Andy? Yes. Andy walks with me, Andy talks with me, Andy tells me I'm his very own. And John walked and talked with Jesus. He ate with Jesus. Amazing. It says, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. John's not only saying that he's an eyewitness, as, G as Peter did, but he's... he's He's reminiscing of the past. He's, he's thinking back. I think of when Jesus first called John. I'm wondering if, as, as John is penning this, I'm wondering if he's just kind of thinking back when he first met the Lord. Did you know that John was a disciple of John the Baptist? 
Here in, in John chapter 1, 35 through 51, John and Andrew were disciples of John the Baptist. And just previously, John baptized Jesus. And, and he was saying of Jesus, of the one, of this one who's coming before me is greater than I am. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal. I, I'm, I'm not even worthy. But then just shortly thereof, as Jesus is walking by, John turns to his disciples, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I mean, just previously, he's like, he's coming with power. He's going to baptize you with water and with what? Fire. Fire. Wow. This guy's powerful. And he's got so much authority. He is so awesome. I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. And then somehow something changed. Newer revelation, the Lord spoke to me. But then it's like not only with power, but he came to be a sacrifice. And he's the Lamb of God. He's the gift of God to man. He's going to bridge a gap. He's taking away sin. And John and Andrew looked and they followed Jesus. They just they left John at that point and started following Jesus. And as they're following Jesus, Jesus says, What are you looking for? And they said, Well, um, where are you staying? That's the best they had. Where, where are you staying? And what they really wanted to spend time with them. Where, where are you staying tonight? Can we hang out? Can we go down to Starbucks, get some coffee, talk a little bit to Coco's. Can we go visit Emma at Coco's together? And, and they wanted to spend time with Jesus. Where are you staying, Lord? And he said, come and see. And that's the first invitation. Jesus says, come and see. And John, I bet it's just recalling, wow, the Lord, the Lord called us to himself and said, come and see, and then Andrew introduces him to Peter, and then to Philip, and then Nathaniel. And then later in Mark chapter 1, we see that Jesus calls Peter and Andrew, James and John. He's, he's walking by the Sea of Galilee, and there is uh, uh, John and Andrew, and they are casting their nets. There's John and James, they're, they're mending their nets. They probably were catching rockfish and got holes in their nets. And Jesus said, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And it says immediately they, they followed him. Immediately. But by the time we get to Luke chapter 5, Jesus has already been on the circuit now. And he's been at different Calvary chapels just sharing and sharing and sharing. And he winds up again at the Sea of Galilee. And there at the Sea of Galilee, he's, there's a boat, and it's, it's Peter's boat, and he says, put me out a little bit. And so Peter rows him out, and he gets out, and he has this natural amphitheater, and there he teaches. And when he's finished, he says, hey, take us out a little bit farther for a catch. And when Jesus invites you to go fishing, you, you go fishing. And he's like, master, we've been fishing all night and have caught nothing, but for you we'll go. And they put out, and you know the story, the, the nets that they were mending are now ripping. They're so filled with fish that the boat is starting to sink. Now, I've been in boats before. I've never been in a sinking boat. <laughs> Yet. Hopefully never. But I've never caught so many fish that the water was actually coming into the boat. And so, so Peter and Andrew call out to, the, to, to James and to John, help us. And, and as, they're, as they're just moving, you know, this cargo, the, all this fish over, Jesus is kind of watching these guys go, this is so great. I mean, it's kind of like at Christmas time when you buy all the gifts for your kids and you're, you're watching them tear into them. And as a happy parent, you're just loving watching your children enjoy. And they're just random. All of a sudden, it hits Peter. This is from the Lord. He did that. We fished all night long and we didn't catch anything. Amazing. And he says, depart from me, Lord, for I am a, I'm a sinful man. I, 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 I don't deserve to have you here in my boat. Depart from me. And Jesus says, you will now be catching men. 
And it says, from that point on, they forsook everything. Three times the Lord called these guys. Three times the Lord spoke to John, follow me. Come and see. Follow me. From now on, you'll catch men. Kind of looking at all of the fish that's in the boat. I mean, it wasn't just saying you're going to you know, catch one here or there. Imagine the scene, the sinking boat, the fish going everywhere. And he goes, and, and now you'll catch men. In the same manner. Not one, not two, not addition, but multiplication. Over and over and over, you'll catch men. John, just thinking, wow, what, what an amazing time. How many times did the Lord call you before you forsook everything? First, they forsook their disciple. They were, they were being taught by John the Baptist. I mean, John the Baptist. That was their man. And, and they left him to follow Jesus. And then they went back out to work, and he's with Dad. They're with Dad working. It's hard to step outside at work and talk about Jesus, isn't it? Or to family. The dad. My dad and I are very similar. We're always right. <laughs> and you know, when two people are always right, it gets kind of hot behind the collar. Because you know what? I'm right. And I know it. But he's dad. And he knows it. Oh. And then, publicly, there he is, preaching to everyone. And everyone saw this miracle, all these fish. And so here we see John and the guys, first they left their disciple, then they, they left, or their, 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 their teacher, their rabbi, and then they, they left their father's business, they left work, they, they left their reputation as the world would see them. And John would find himself slowly becoming in the company of fewer and fewer men. First, there was the believers. And there was a multitude. And then there was 12. But as we read on, remember in, in, in Mark chapter 5, Jairus' daughter, we were looking at that just Thursday, weren't we? And, and Jesus let three men go and besides the mom and dad. Who were those three men? Peter, James, and John. You get to think of Mo, Curly, and no, it was Peter, James, and John. Mount of Transfiguration. Who was there? John found himself in what we, we call it the inner circle. You know, just the guys. That meant the other guys were kind of left out at times. As Jesus just breathed into, hey, I want to share this with you. And he would just share. These three guys would see Jesus in a whole new light as, as God would, would just transfigure the sun. He'd be all white, and there would be Moses and Elijah, and they knew that because of their name tags. <laughs> and, and God would speak out because Peter's so excited. Hey, we're going to build a tabernacle, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And God's like, be quiet. This is my son, whom all please listen to him. We do that at our house. You guys do that? That's, that's quite for sit down, be quiet, be polite. Just, that's an abbreviation. At the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was so distressed that he sweat blood, three times he'd come to these three disciples and say, hey, watch and pray that you would not enter into temptation. Watch and pray that you would not enter into temptation. Could you not watch and pray for an hour? Watch and pray. Those three men were Peter, James, and John. Well, it got even smaller as, as Jesus would send Peter and John to prepare for the Passover. And then finally, at the cross, who... Who all gathered together at the cross? Do you remember? In that gathering of, of all those great apostles. Who was there at the foot of the cross? John. John alone. John alone was there to the point where Jesus would look at John and say, 
Son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. What an amazing gift. gift. I can't even put words to it. I want to say responsibility. Privilege. What an amazing privilege to, to take care of the mother of his Savior. We don't hear much of, about Mary after that, but John was given this privilege <clears throat> to take care of. Responsibility. I think it would come natural taking care of, 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 of the mother of your Savior. I think it would come natural. I bet he treated her as his own mother. John, thinking back, I can't believe that he even chose me. Man, he had to call him three times for me to really forsake everything. I thought about that this week. How many times did the Lord knock on my door? How many times is he saying, hey, Dave, come and see. Dave, follow me. Dave. <laughs> he says in verse 3 now, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship. That you would have fellowship with us. That word koinonia. What a, what a great word. It, it means fellowship, but it means association and community. Joint participation. That word really wasn't used all that much. It was kind of like, like, like utopia. The utopia is the, the, oh man, imagine world peace. Imagine everyone living in harmony. This this beautiful world. The word utopia comes from two Greek words. You know that. Not place or no place. Utopia literally means there's no place like that. And Koine was like, imagine everyone finally getting along. Your children not arguing in the back seat of the car. <laughs> <laughs> People, people, that's utopia. That's utopia. <laughs> the church not arguing over what color the church building is. That's utopia. What do we have decaf coffee or do we not have decaf coffee? We have regular coffee and water. Solves the issue. But utopia, that's not even an issue. Koinonia says, I put your needs above my needs. What flavor decaf coffee would you like? No. I heard that girl. Honey. No, please. <laughs> Koinonia. What a great thing. And we stamp that word on so many different things, don't we? Koinonia. I mean, we all know Acts 2.42, you know, and they continued in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and of prayer. We, we understand that, but look, look what this looks like in Acts 2, 44 through 47. This is what Koinonia looks like. Now, all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Now, this isn't socialism or communism. Bernie Sanders isn't here. This is just people putting others' needs in front of theirs. <laughs> that's what Quinania is it's real fellowship of saying you're more important than I am no no you're more important than I am no no you're more important than I am and truly what is it that you need take it take it we were talking Thursday night about how how when Jesus was walking with Jairus and it was just packed and they're trying to get to Jairus' daughter's house and someone touched him and Jesus said, and Jesus felt power leave him. You ever wonder what that felt like? All of a sudden, Jesus felt power leave him and Jesus says, who touched me? And they said, come on. Seriously? Who didn't touch you? Everyone is touching you. Ah, but there's one woman wasn't there. 
one woman who needed to touch Jesus. She said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just touch it, I'll be healed. She had been bleeding for 12 years. And yet when she reached out and touched him, Jesus felt power leave him. Do you know what that tells me? It costs us something to do things, doesn't it? There's a cost in everything Jesus did, even when he was looking this way, and she'd come from behind and touch him, and he'd go, Koinonia says, I'm willing for that to come from me. You ever prayed for someone? Lord, I just pray you'd help this individual with their finances. Anyone pray for someone else's finances? Go ahead and raise your hand if you pray for someone's finances. You should be praying more then. Here's the deal. For those of you that are praying for people's finances, you need to be willing to be the one who God's using for those finances. Anyone ever pray for a homeless person? Go ahead. If you prayed for someone. Does anyone have a hand that's broken? <laughs> anyone pray? The point is, is if I'm asking God, I need to be used and be willing for me to be the vessel he's using. That's koinonia. I mean, we put koinonia on... Hey, we got the uh, Koinonia Surfing Fellowship. We've got the Women's Knitting Fellowship. We've got Koinonia Coffee. And we just stamp Koinonia on it or say fellowship, and all of a sudden it's Christian. But that's not what he says here. Listen, he says, That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly... Our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Real fellowship always begins with God. That's what real fellowship is, was from. That's why the world never, ever used the word koinonia until when the church was born. And they said, that is utopia. Because that just doesn't happen out here. That's koinonia. That's fellowship. They're selling their goods for other people. No. Yes, they are. They're taking care of one another. And that's what koinonia is all about. And John says, we would have that you had fellowship with us, but first, our fellowship is truly with, with God and with his son, Jesus Christ. That's where fellowship begins. That's where it begins. Back in Acts 44, excuse me, Acts 2, 44 through 47, it says they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And it started with, with, with the Lord, obviously, but there was this worshiping in unity. You know, as I was worshiping today, just hearing, one of the things I like to do, well, obviously, I love to worship the Lord, but I love to hear people lead worship from the pew. I love it when I can hear someone go, oh, that's, that's Krista Allen singing. Praise you, Lord. Oh, I can hear that. That's, that's Tony worshiping the Lord. And we're worshiping in unity. And it's not that I'm trying to take my eyes off of Jesus, but as we all start to raise these anthems of praise to the Lord, we become one voice. And they're worshiping in unity, and they live in this joy and gladness and hospitality. And that's when the Lord added, why? Everyone was digging Jesus. Everyone was truly loving the Lord. Their focus really wasn't on the color of the building or the flavor of the coffee, but of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Mm -hmm. As they started to see Jesus in the lives of these people, the Lord said, that is koinonia. And he added to the church, truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. You see, if if God is light. Those are the three things that we see in, in 1 John. Is The three characteristics is God is, is light. Chapter 1, verse 5, God is love. Chapter 4, verse 8, 
and God is life, chapter 5, 12, and 20. These three characteristics, we're going to find these different litmus tests to see if, if I'm truly a believer of Christ. I say, look at these, these characteristics of God, and if I don't find that in myself, I have to ask myself, am I saved? Am I saved? Next week, we're going to be looking at God as light, looking at how a true believer is truly light, and he walks in the light, for he is in the light. We examine ourselves. And he goes on with verse 4, And these things we write to you that you might be kind of happy. <laughs> Is that what that says? <laughs> I must have the wrong translation. Oh, over here it says, And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Man, I should have a, a grin from ear to ear. Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness far more than his companions. Jesus was an excited, joyful man. He was, he was joyful. So what I want to, I want to, I want to practice something. This is, this is a tough exercise. I do this a few times a day. You ready? On the count of three, we're all going to smile. One, two, three. You see, practice makes better. Yeah. They say a smile increases your face value. But the deal is, is Jesus is the reason. He's full of joy. I was just talking to a brother today who's, who's hurting. How do I find joy in the pain? Have you asked that question? Oh, you're not raising your hands today. I forgot. How do I find joy in the pain? R O L no, J E S U S, Jesus. We all suffer pain from time to time. I was talking to to Dave Setnick last week. I was talking to Tim this morning. Two of my brothers that both lost lost wives. Where's Jesus in all of this? Well, he's the one that's holding you up. You're here today because he's the one that's holding you and he's carrying you. And it's hard sometimes finding joy in the pain, but he, God says, these things we write that your joy may be full. He wants you to be full, Tim, Carol, JD. The Lord wants you to be full of his joy. Listen to what he says here in John chapter 15. These are the red letters. And as far as I'm concerned, Jesus did say this. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Do you see how he does that? When we have fellowship with the Lord, by abiding with the Lord, he puts his joy in our heart and it causes our joy to be full. When we simply have fellowship and walk and abide in Christ. Morning devotions, evening prayer. Guys, get in the Word and let his joy get into you. I mean, I know that we take life seriously, but we don't have to look like it. We can have a smile on our face all the time. If you have to put a little Vaseline right here, <laughs> then do it. Just every now and then, just look at your face and see if the Lord is true, if you're reflecting his joy. No, I'm not coming down on you. I'm trying to encourage you. New. Before I bought these things here, I remember going to work and so it's like, what's the matter? Nothing's the matter. You look so angry. I'm not angry. And I go to work, you know, the next week or the next day, whenever, whenever I went to work. And they say, what's the matter? Nothing. Why are you so mad? I'm not mad. Now I'm mad. <laughs> over and over again, people will keep saying, 
What's the matter? <laughs> I don't know what's the matter. And finally, I, I, I thought, I looked in the mirror. I'm driving home and I'm adjusting my mirror. I think someone was borrowing my car. And I looked in there and you know what I had on my face? A scowl. I looked like a pirate. <laughs> Eyes are all furrowed. Do you know why? I couldn't see. <laughs> I went, I got glasses, and I see a whole new view. Now here's the deal, gang. As we look through the lens of his word, what is it that you see? Life. Life. Isn't life worth living? Yes. Aren't you glad to be alive, Jeff? Every day. I am so glad you're alive. Me too. Eric, I'm glad you're alive. Everyone, I'm glad you're alive. smile. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy. I mean, we, don't, we don't have to be so serious all the time. I mean, we do. We just don't have to look like it. <laughs> I like what Peter said. In, as we were reading Peter, he talked about that inexpressible, unspeakable joy. As I reflect that, he chose me. When, when I look at some of you and I realize he chose you, I just think of joy. I think of amazing grace. <clears throat> How sweet the sound. I mean, really. So here's the application for today. It's, it's, it's easy. It's remember and be mindful of those first days and conversation you have with the Lord. As John was getting ready to, to just debunk this whole Gnostic thing, he stopped and went, I touched him. I walked with him. I ate with him. He's my Lord. He's my friend. Remember those conversations. And let, let me, uh, this week, I got, I've got a little homework assignment for you. Okay, ready? What was the first thing that God revealed to you of his nature? When you first, when you first started seeking the Lord and he revealed himself to you, write that down. What did God, what was the first thing? And then the second thing, what's the last thing he said to you? What's the last, what's the last revelation God gave you? Or maybe the last command, I want you to go do this. I want you to look at those two this week. How God, how God first reached out to you and how he presently is reaching out to you. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to say, let me see your homework. <laughs> Did anybody call anybody last week? <laughs> what? Did anybody call anybody last week? No, I did. I did. Thank you, Tim. You called someone last week? Do you remember what was asked last week? Yeah, three, three contacts. Three contacts and tell them about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Good. I did two out of three. You did two out of three. There you go, two out of three. Do I hear four out of three? <laughs> So this week, you don't have to ask anybody, but you might, might find yourself asking the Lord, what was that again, Lord? What did you ask me? What did you show me? So remember and be mindful of the first days. Isn't that what Jesus told Ephesus? As Ephesus was slipping back a little bit, he said what? He said, remember from where you would fallen. Go back and do the first works. And he's saying, refresh that. Be excited about that first thing. What was the first thing that God revealed to you? And then secondly, is stay in fellowship. Stay in fellowship with the Lord and with the body. Stay connected to Jesus Christ. Abide in him and his word in you and you'll bear much fruit. Your smile will get bigger. I, I guarantee it. And number three, Know that this was written that your joy would be, be made full. John wants you to reflect as he is reflecting. And his joy is full. As you start to remember, as we start digging into this, it's for your joy. As we were reading James, it was never, it, the, the, the motto, the logo was be mature, be a man. 
as we looked at Peter, it was uh, um, be holy. In 2 Peter, it was be aware. This one's be joyful. Be joyful. Let's pray. Father, I want to just thank you for, for loving us.